thank you all for coming this wonderful evening on this wonderful occasion. Um, we would like to begin. I'm delighted. I'm also short. So let's see. Uh, okay. So that's exactly. I'm delighted to welcome you to the opening of the Hecht Museum's special exhibition, Arrivals, Departures, the Oscar Gez Collection, Salvaged Works by Persecuted Jewish Artists in Paris. We are honored tonight to be joined by Professor Claude Gez, Deputy Head of Mission at the Swiss Embassy, uh, Anne-Lise Catin, Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Hecht Museum, Dr. Harry Zessler, Chairman of the Board of Governors, Professor Alfred Tauber. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to wave to you and to acknowledge your presence. <laughs> Vice Chair, Lady Irene Hatter. Chairman of the Executive Committee, Muli Eden. President, Professor Ron Rubin. Robin, excuse me, Vice President for External Relations and Resource Development, Professor Don Chernov, Rector, Professor Gustavo Mesh, relatives and descendants of the artists, Mr. Eli Krzyzewski. Can you stand, please? Eli? Ah, Yofi. <laughs> and uh, Galia and Yair Regev. Yofi, Toda, Hamon Toda. Uh, head of the Weiss Livnat Holocaust Studies graduate program, Professor Arie Kochavi, honored members of the board, senior administration, faculty, students, friends, and esteemed guests. This exhibition and its accompanying catalog are part of a two year long research and curating project of the Weiss Livnat International Program in Holocaust Studies which is named after the late Auschwitz survivor Yitzhak Livnat and generously supported by his son, Dr. Doron Livnat and his wife, Marianne. They were very much looking forward to being here with us today at this special event, but unfortunately could not come at the last minute and they send their regrets. I would personally like to thank them and the head of our department, Professor Arye Kochavi for backing this project from its inception and recognizing the value of art in Holocaust studies. It is now my great honor to invite the president of the university, Professor Ron Robin, to the podium to open the exhibition. Thank you. Good evening, distinguished guests. Wonderful to see you here. Um, we have acknowledged many of the people who are behind this. Let me also acknowledge that wonderful group of students standing in the corner who curated the event. We are delighted, we are honored. It's a very emotional occasion for us over here tonight. The exhibition of the guest collection and the accompanying catalog is one of the most ambitious endeavors that we've ever done here at the Hecht Museum. This painstaking research brings to life um, Jewish artists, we tell their stories, we present their work. It was a labor of love by this wonderful group of students. Rachel, thank you so much for your work as well in this. Arik, for being the, the spirit behind this. And of course, ha Harry, for this extraordinary edifice in which we are right now. The students of the Weiss Livna program dedicated so much of their time and so much of their love to make this possible for us uh, to see here today. They immerse themselves in the story of these 18 artists who you see in front of you as you walk through this exhibition. I would say that this exhibition in many ways can be described as a resurrection, twofold. It's a res resurrection, first of all, of the lives of these incredible people, these incredible artists, many of whom perished in the Holocaust. We're bringing them back to life here at this museum. We see this as a mission, we see this as a vocation, and this, for us, is perhaps one of the most important things. It's an inspirational journey. It's an inspirational journey of our body and our soul. 
and so much beauty is being brought back to life. It's also uh, a another type of resurrection. It's a resurrection of our ties with the Guest family that over the years have somehow disappeared and they're coming back to life now. Thanks to you, Claude, and we're very happy to have you here among us. Um, we're inspired by your father's legacy. It's an important part of our life here at the university and we're honored to see you here uh, as among our guests. Um, and we hope you, we do you pride, of course, in this exhibition. So um, we salute our wonderful students for, and teachers, the Weisslevenat program in Holocaust Studies. This is the only international Holocaust Studies program in Israel, I believe, with more than 150 graduates coming from more than 30 countries. Nowadays, I would say, um, we accomplish another mission. Um, universities today are very much engrossed in technology. Often we talk about artificial intelligence and the like. And what I think is quite extraordinary about this exhibition is uh, that it provides us with an intelligent look at the past without being artificially engineered. It's an intellectually demanding exhibition to see. It's an emotional exhibition to see. Um, intellectuals are born and raised as such. You have brought them back to life. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming the Deputy Head of Mission at the Swiss Embassy, Madame Anne-Lise Catin, for a few introductory words. Thank you so much. Mr. President, Monsieur Professor, it's a great honor for me to be with you today, this evening here. Uh, I would like to salute especially the teachers and the students who worked on this exhibition. Uh, you know that uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Claude Guez and his family in Geneva contributed to bring into Geneva a more vibrant culture. It has been a very important contribution to the city. Uh, and for this, we are very grateful. Um, maybe you know it or not, Switzerland uh, is uh, very committed in, uh, Holocaust in supporting Holocaust studies. So until a couple of weeks ago, Switzerland had the presidency of the IHRA, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, where we are always very committed and uh, engaged. And um, I couldn't imagine a more inspiring place to have this incredible exhibition. So I wish you a very delightful evening. Thank you very much. Um, can I lower the lights or put the screen on? Um, The title of this exhibition, Arrivals, Departures, derives from the opening poem of French poet Charlotte Delbault, Auschwitz and After, a trilogy she wrote upon her return from Auschwitz. I have taught Delbault's poem in my classes for many years, but it was only when I began this project that her title hit home. On one of my many pilgrimages to Paris, for this project, I plotted out on a map and uh, uh, clustered in and around Montparnasse uh, on the peripheries of Paris, uh, with, really within a very short radius of one another, all of the artists last places of uh, uh, residence, uh, the places that were listed on their transport pages, on their page de convoi. And um, it was only when I stumbled on, on the street that I realized where I was. Uh, Fassini, whose beautiful photograph of the Eiffel Tower graces the flag advertising the exhibition outside, who is undoubtedly one of our most innovative and experimental artists, whose nephew, Elie Krzyzewski, is here with us today. Fassini lived at 37 Rue du Départ, 37, the Street of Departures. 
The Street of Departures, which is right next to, in fact, on top of the Gare de Montparnasse, the train station of Montparnasse, flanked on the other side by the Rue de l'Arrivée, the Street of Arrivals, so deported from the Street of Departures. Arrivals Departures introduces 18 promising Jewish artists of the Ecole de Paris whose lives and careers were cut short by the Holocaust. It traces their varied paths as they left their homelands in Eastern Europe to move to Paris and pursue artistic careers only to be persecuted during the Shoah. Arrivals Departures brings their personal stories and their work back into focus, featuring some of the only remaining works by these artists. Arrivals Departures also marks a new departure for this collection. The first catalog, Memorial in Honor of Jewish Artists Victims of Nazism, dates back to 1978 when the do donation was made and the permanent collection was installed at the University of Haifa in the Eshkol Tower. Twenty years later, in 1996, Sanford Shaman published a catalog of the collection entitled 18 Artists Who Perished in the Holocaust. Today, at another interval of 20 years, we are revisiting these artists and their work. And really, I think, um, I'm hoping one of the things that you'll uh, uh, see in the exhibition is uh, uh, a, a new departure. These works are placed in a broader context. Documentary footage and photographs offer a fuller picture of the Parisian art scene in the pre-war period and shed light on the ways in which the implementation of the final solution affected each artist and his or her work. Based on new scholarship and archival research, this long overdue examination of the Gez collection weds art and history. Last year, when our program, when our project began, each student adopted two artists. We got to work in the archives using the databases at Yad Vashem and the Centre de Documentation Juive Contemporaine in Paris. We collected as many traces of these artists' lives as possible, photographs, identity cards, uh, writings, correspondence, deportation lists, and we tracked down descendants and traveled to France to interview them. We translated texts from Yiddish, from French, from Russian, from Czech, uh, 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 from Polish. We corresponded with auction houses, galleries, and researchers around the globe, discovering new information about the artist's personal lives. And I'll just scroll through some of the photographs um, of our students in the archives. This is us at Lohamea Getaot, looking at uh, works in the storage room. One of the first things we did was to photograph all of the works in color. Um, this is the first time that many of the works were uh, featured and uh, beautifully displayed in the catalog. Claude Gez came to visit us last year and uh, gave us some more insight. And I went to visit Claude in Geneva at the Petit Palais to select works for the, collect for the exhibition. This year, our graduate students had the opportunity to get their hands dirty, to use the research that we did last year to curate a new exhibition, to see and handle objects up close in the museum storage room. Several of them uh, returned to Paris with me uh, to visit important sites. We visited museums to view their collections of works by these artists. We updated and refined information in object records. We selected the works from lending institutions and documentary media. We wrote the labels and the descriptive labels, procured documentary images and footage, wrote wall text, a brochure, postcards, and promotional material. The students were involved in every single aspect of the exhibition's design, installation, and content. Yes, please. <laughs> and these are some of my favorite uh, photographs. This is Annika with Isabel Weingarten, Pninit with Viviane Dimermanas, Ella with Galia Regev. This is me with Daniel D'Amboise uh, François, the uh, niece of Epstein. Annika and I with Lydie Lacanal the daughter of Leon Weisberg, us in front of the Musée d'Art et d'Histoire du Judaïsme in Paris, in the archives, 
reading a Fenster book in Yiddish on these artists and really uh, getting our hands dirty. Installations. So um, all of you, Pninit, Margarita, Rivka, Ella, Annika, and all of the students that were involved last year. Um, <laughs> Tuti, I see you. Who else is here from last year? Igor is here. Nice to see you. Yes, you have been absolutely integral to this project. Three of you have been with it since its inception, and you helped birth it with me last year. Thank you for sticking with it and with me. This year, I had the extraordinary good fortune of having three more students uh, join our team of Annika Tovit and Pninit, Ella Faldorf, and uh, Rivka Baum and Margarita Penchenko joined the team. Each of you, according to uh, excuse me, <laughs> uh, each of you, according to your own areas of interest and expertise. Some of you brought your organizational skills and training in art history. Others, your aesthetic sense and background in design and decoration. Still others, a deep ethical commitment to these artists, a responsibility to the dead, and a willingness to do whatever it took to make this project a reality. For me, this has been a profoundly transformative experience, and I hope it has been for you too. You have exceeded my expectations. You can and should congratulate yourselves on this remarkable achievement. Thank you. And just uh, a few other words of thanks. In keeping with the exhibition's uh, theme and its title, the project has been a journey that began two years ago, and almost by chance, it was the brainchild of Sharon Poliakin, who together with Yael Granot uh, ben first presented the idea to me. And I owe a huge debt of gratitude to many people, Reli Urist, Ilan Iskar, Shlomit Kitvi, and the entire staff in my department, and the entire Hecht Museum staff, Adi Knan and Ina Ber uh, Berkovich, Shai Levi, Meir Argaman, Nir Ben Simchon, and uh, Kobi Mizrahi. Most of all, I need to thank Shunit Marmelstein. Shunit Marmelstein, the director of this amazing institution, the Hecht Museum. Shunit, you have more than met me halfway. Um, and I know that I took you out of your comfort zone at certain times, um, but I have the utmost respect for your tireless work on behalf of this museum, your attention to detail and expertise. I would like to single out also Orly Hatsofe. Orly, please say you're here. No, Yala, <laughs> Kadima. Orly, you are the best of collaborators and the best of friends. You took every crazy idea that I threw at you and you brought it to life with the highest level of professionalism. This project has been enriched by your creativity, your calm, and your commitment. I can't thank you enough. And to Nadav Goldstein for the beautiful printing. We are deeply grateful to the lenders of, to the exhibition, the Tel Aviv Museum, the Mishkan Museum in Ein Harod, Yad Vashem, Lochamei Getaot, and especially the Petit Palais in Geneva for their important and generous loans. If I'm not mistaken, Claude, I think this is the first time these gorgeous works have been shown in Israel. Thank you for continuing. Yes, thank you. Thank you for continuing your father's mission and his legacy in conceiving of, of art as a means of commemoration. And lastly, please forgive me, but I need to thank my family, Noah, Caleb, Ezra, Atara, and Maya. You can stand. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for welcoming eight teen artists to our dinner table on a nightly basis. You have listened to and supported this project from its inception, sharing in its ups and downs, and offering ideas and suggestions, Maya. Um, uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank my husband, uh, Jordan Rubinson. C'est grâce à toi. I would now like to uh, uh, call uh, Vice President Dan Chernoff to the BAMA um, to present a token. Yeah, let me just scroll through. Thank you. Claude. Okay. So it's my great pleasure and honor, and with deep appreciation, uh, we want to honor you 
for your support and assistance in the creation of the exhibition Arrivals Departures of the Oscar Gez Collection at our university and for sharing our vision of salvaging the art of um, Jewish artists and commemorating um, their memories and for really being such a great supporter of uh, this project with all our hearts, please accept this uh, token. I have two more words to say. Please um, indulge me. Um, one of the most unassuming works in our collection is a watercolor of a bridge by the, by the artist and the poet Max Jacob. I'm bringing it to you here. It's OK. I, I need you to see the size of it. Um, I asked each of the students uh, to make a selection of their favorite works from the collection. I made up my own list of the collection. This painting that you see behind you was not on any of our lists, to the best of my recollection. I suspect this is the first time it has been seen, uh, has seen the light of day since its donation. It's not the most tragic work in the collection or the most historically significant. It is not the biggest or the most colorful or the most erotic or the most experimental. It doesn't flex its muscles or cry for attention. In fact, it's barely there on the page. Soft pastel washes, subtle and delicate, really pointing to the tenuousness and the fragility of art making. Building a bridge can be a scary process filled with unpredictable results, precarious, a task requiring foresight and trust. It has not been lost on me how special and unique, how truly extraordinary this opportunity has been. Taxing at times, but an unparalleled experience. The Hecht Museum, I don't know if you know, uh, the Hecht Museum is the only museum within a university uh, in Israel. And uh, what, what a gem it is, what, what a remarkable resource. I would like to think of a teaching museum in the same way that we speak of teaching hospitals, um, but this really is a, a place where ideas were born and then born out uh, in a remarkable, remarkable way. I don't take it for granted we started without a template, and we built this together, all of us, through trial and error, compromise and dialogue, sketched out a working plan step by step, like a bridge and exhibition requires ingenuity and skill, but above all, collaboration. It requires not just the architect, but the surveyor, the engineer, and every single worker who contributes his or her time, effort, and experience. My dear friend, Claude, for as long as I have known you, and since you first greeted me about two years ago at the Petit Palais in Geneva, one particular bridge has preoccupied a great deal of your thought. It is one of the treasures of the collection of the Petit Palais, the Pont de l'Europe by Gustave Caillebotte. And it is not a coincidence that I chose to speak about a bridge tonight. Your father held a strong belief that art could and should be used in the service of peace, understanding, and dialogue. 
Max Jacob's bridge can serve as a reminder that sometimes the smallest details, the most overlooked objects, can open new avenues of thinking, new connections. Your father had the foresight, uh, and really it, prescient, really prescient, to collect these works of art when nobody else was to recognize their value. It is my firm belief, and I really would like to offer my thanks and appreciation to Yael Granot Ben and to Professor Arye Kochavi for helping me realize this. You have made this all possible. And the, the commitment and the love and the devotion that you have to this program and to its students is unparalleled. Um, this collection, I think, like all art, can be a bridge builder. It has prompted new perspectives on the past, reaching out across space and time, bridging the present and the past, the museum world and the academic world, students and teachers, Holocaust studies and art history, allowing us to draw connections between disciplines, between generations, and between communities. I hope this exhibition has legs. I hope it travels like arrivals and departures. I hope it travels. I hope there are other iterations of this one. This exhibition contains really some very unique elements, which I will uh, in invite you to see in a few minutes. Um, but it is now um, my hope that people will come away from this exhibition with a palpable sense of what was lost, but also what was found, thanks in large part to Oscar Gez, his son Claude Gez, and to all of the students in this project. I thank you so much for your friendship, for your uh, remarkable uh, commitment to this project, to me, and to Holocaust studies, all of you. Kolakavod. It is now my pleasure to invite uh, Claude, Professor Claude Gez to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. I'm, I'm very moved. Um, um, <laughs> Before I, I begin, I, I would love, like to acknowledge and, and thank um, um, Deputy Head of Mission uh, at the Swiss Embassy, Mrs. Annelise Catin. Uh, the chairman of the executive committee of the Hecht Museum, uh, uh, Dr. Harry Zessler. Um, there we go. <laughs> there we go. The chairman of the Board of Governors, Professor Alfred um, uh, uh, Tauber. Um, where is he? Oh, you're there. I was hoping you would bring your wife also. No, but I, I wanted to talk to her about about uh, about a lecture of hers. <laughs> um, uh, of course, uh, pre uh, President and Professor Ron Rubin, with whom we've had some, there we go, uh, it, wonderful conversations. And I, I look forward to very much more in the future. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, the Vice President for External Relations and uh, Research, Resource Development, Professor Dan Chernoff, we um, have had some fantastic conversations, and I really hope that mm, where, wherever he has Oscar disappeared to, where's where's Dan? Uh, there he is. Uh, um, and uh, the artist families and representative, Mr. Eli uh, Krzyzewski, Mrs. Galia Rigab, the head of the Weiss Libnat Holocaust Studies and uh, master's program, Professor Ari Kochabi, Kochabi, Kochabi or Kochabi, um, honored members of the board and senior administration, friends, faculties, students, and guests. I am very honored to be here, and it's a very great pleasure. Uh, this painting was donated by my late father in 1978, and it has hibernated sort of since then. It, um, and it really is through, um, through the work 
of Rachel Perry, who came to visit a few years ago, that somehow managed to track me down because I'm usually quite hard to reach. I'm hard. I'm, I'm, I'm very hard to reach. Uh, but I. But uh, anyway, we tracked each other down, and I came to to understand a remarkable person. I. Like my father, my father started, his interest in art came late in life. He had started off as a businessman. I started off as a, as a scientist, as an experimental scientist. I look, and I spent all of my life really looking at, de at details and going from that one detail to a slightly larger story, given an idea I had about how things might be. And then when you do, when you do science, usually you have to, and you do experiments, you try to decide between alternative hypotheses because uh, if one, you know, in one case you might find this and in the other you would find that if you design the experiment right. But if you design the experiment right, there's a third solution, a third possibility you hadn't thought of. And it's always that. <laughs> and that's the one you, you hadn't thought of. And you've got to keep your eyes open. And um, indeed, it was, it, it was I, I have not met uh, previously, another art historian with that same attitude, that, and I see she's inculcated that in her students. And I, I, I think this is absolutely wonderful, and I'm, I'm thrilled. So I do, as, as implicit in what Rachel had mentioned, I've come, come very late to the, uh, to, to thinking and considering art. Uh, but I have started also from one thing. And that one thing led to something else, and something else, and then something else. And pretty soon, you, you're actually encompassing a, a vast amount of space. Human motivation, politics, philosophy, and who knows what. Um, so I have, uh, I, it is interesting to me to see my father's trajectory because he, as I said, came to this late, as, as I did, and he intuitively understood um, that uh, he had gone through the... Uh, he, my, my father was... Um, I'm sort of having to take off from notes, but he, uh, my father was born in Tunisia of an Italian mother and a Tunisian father. Uh, his mother was, um, uh, his, his mother's father was a, um, a very well-known physician to the king of Italy, and blah, 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 all kinds of things. And he used to like to talk about how this and that. Now, as I was looking to prepare this talk here, what, what struck me was I was sort of looking through some, some books I had, and here I find that this guy here was the one who negotiated with the rabbinate in uh, Tunisia. He had been exiled, having been collaborating with Mazzini in, in Italy. He was exiled to Tunisia and became the physician to the Bay. And, and while he was there, he had to negotiate through lengthy negotiation with the rabbinate in Tunisia in order, as a representative of the Alliance Universelle, uh, of the Alliance Universelle, attempting uh, with some success, I would say, to convince and eventually got them to accept that the, that the schools would teach uh, a, modern, a modernized curriculum. It happened that my father's father was related to Rabbi Getz, who was the rabbi of the Kotel. And I came across some letters between my father and the rabbi. And it was a dialogue of the deaf. Um, one person would say something, and the other person would say something completely different, unrelated. And there was absolutely no way to, it was very difficult to bridge that gap. Um, and this morning, when I picked up the newspaper, <laughs> what do I see? I see much the same kind of dialogue happening today. And so I really do hope, um, in the meanwhile, I would say that um, the state has been created. You now have a faculty of science that is world famous. I, uh, and I've interacted with neuroscientists and in other, in other departments. 
And the state of Israel exists today because of the civilization of the Enlightenment. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that if we are all alive today, it is because science and because the ability and the culture of the Enlightenment that allows individuals like Rachel to challenge anything and, and encourages people to look for themselves for solutions is the answer to all problems. And we don't know what those, the problem for any one of us is that we don't know what the answer is. And, we, and it will be our children who will find it out. We have to make our children be able to see because you can't teach people to think. You can teach them to see, to see and to listen. When I hear Mr. Trump talk in the United States, I hear Mussolini. In my ears, I can hear that. And the haranguing that, you have, that, you, that has also extended to other countries is something that is frightening. I am optimistic, though, that the, this will pass. Tyrants have come and gone throughout history, all the way back. Uh, however, I think there is a need to be optimistic. If you look at, um, you know, if you care to watch, um, um, uh, if you care to simply look at what we have achieved, childhood mortality has dropped. The population has been, has been the world population is lift out of poverty uh, to, to a considerable degree in the, past, in the past 10, 20, 30 years. There is continuing progress. It's just that from the ground up, you don't necessarily see it. You see it from the top down. And these are unexpected results. You don't when you set off on the path, you don't know exactly, you don't know where you will get. And it's that optimism that, the, that our civilization uh, allows. So I am looking, I believe that artists and art is what can allow, uh, uh, what can permit, what can serve as a, uh, as a bridge between between, between, from one person to another person to another, and, and to open up new, a new uh, understanding of each, own, each one's reality, because we're not able to do it ourselves. There is no text, that, well, there's no instruction manual to tell you where to go. You have to find it on your own, and you won't really know when you found it. it because you see, for example, that bridge that, that Rachel was showing, when you analyze it, that bridge did not exist. It was unreal. <laughs> it was a fantasy. <laughs> but everybody assumed that it existed, but it did not. It, uh, it, there was no bridge that looked like that. Um, from any place that you could you could sit, uh, and so in that particular case, it was intentional. But in general, um, we don't really know where we're going to end up. So I think that we need bridges across people to, for new new findings to to occur and to take us further. And and with that, I would like to thank you. to invite all of you to come into the exhibition. Um, the graduate students will be in the exhibition, available to guide you and to answer any questions that you may have. Um, please, please feel free to lean on them and to get some uh, insight and some uh, guidance from them. Thank you so much for coming.